struggling with uh, my disease, with the drug addiction for say 25 years. It's been very hard for me. It's been an emotional roller coaster for my family and everybody else around me. And uh, I just love to smoke crack. I don't want to be an addict. I want to be an addict. I want to be an alcoholic. And sometimes I, I'm just not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. I just, you know, I just can't do it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm struggling real bad. It's, it's hard. It's hard for me. You know, it, you know, because I still want to do what I want to do. Nobody's ever recognized him for doing anything. Up until now, the only thing that's been done is negative behavior was punished. Now, with this, he really felt that somebody recognized what he did. Patients began to kind of come and joke around, which really changed the culture of the clinic. There's nothing like coming to a place and being embraced by strangers. But as far as like a, a prize for a clean urine, for showing up for group, um, if that's your incentive to come here, then that's great because what you get while you're here is amazing. And then the peer support that happens during the uh, recognition ceremonies is uh, extremely moving. It, it's so positive. They'll call out the name uh, of the person and they'll explain why that person is being recognized. Uh, and the whole group will be, hey, hey, uh, and cheering them on. for a lot of people because they're not used to having something given to them without a fear of it being taken back. It's giving them courage to stand up and say, hey, I, 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 I really deserve this. I'm worth something. Hi, my name is John Hamilton, and thank you for your interest in what myself and many others believe is an innovative and effective approach for treating the disease of addiction, motivational incentives. Sometimes referred to as contingency management, motivational incentives has been studied in the addiction field for over 30 years. Today, this evidence-based treatment is part of a growing trend to reinforce positive behavior. Honestly, it, it, they, that is a program that will definitely work. It would definitely work for people that have been in a program for a month or more of clean, you know, clean use. And that's from honesty. That's from being there and back. It's worked out very well because whereas even though we had good attendance at group meetings, um, of course it's increased because now instead of only going to three meetings, which would entitle them to one pull, we have clients going to nine meetings a week. <laughs> it's like a whole new way of looking at their lives. Now they do something good and it's recognized as good and people are giving them credit for good. We saw a significant improvement with our retention rates. Our one month retention, three months, six months had skyrocketed over just three quarters. And we attributed that directly to contingency management. When I came to Baltimore in 1974, um, I had the idea of applying behavioral analysis and behavioral therapy principles to drug abuse, which hadn't really been done before. And so we took the very, very basic operant conditioning model. You have a target behavior, you have a reinforcer, you link them together through a contingency, and as B.F. Skinner had shown, you can increase the frequency of that behavior that you're reinforcing. So in 1999, the National Drug Abuse Treatment Clinical Trials Network was established. The purpose of the Clinical Trials Network, or the CTN as we call it, 
um, was to bring clinicians and researchers together at the same table to discuss uh, how to improve drug abuse treatment throughout the country, really, but to do it primarily through conducting effectiveness research in community treatment settings. Now we wanted to know, do these incentive programs that have worked so well in the small sample trials, do they also still work when they're implemented in real life, real world community treatment programs? In all, we enrolled 800 patients in this MIDAR study, and that is incredible. It is the largest multi-site trial of motivational incentives that's ever been conducted, and uh, that was something that we were very proud of. I needed to come up with a way that was less costly and that still might be um, effective in terms of reducing uh, drug use behavior. So that's how I sort of came about with the fishbowl procedure. And it's usually we're reinforcing submission of negative urine samples. So urine samples will detect whether anyone's used a particular substance in the last two to three days. And if they have not, that's when they earn their draw from the fishbowl. Um, so you test, collect their urine sample, test it. If it tests negative, they get draws from the fishbowl. So your first clean sample, it's usually one draw from the fishbowl. If you're clean two times in a row, it's two draws. Three times in a row, three draws, and so forth. And then we all often cap the number of draws you can get at any given time at 10. So once you get up to 10 negative urines in a row, you just stay at 10 draws, even though you might have been clean 15 times in a row. And important features associated with that are is if you miss a urine sample because you don't show up at the clinic a day you're scheduled, or you test positive, um, or you refuse to give a sample, all that would reset the number of draws you get the next time you're clean. I've had a lot of my clients say to me, you know what, this has changed me. This helped me stay clean. And it wasn't just the prizes. I've even had people who weren't even in the CM group actually enjoy who went to the urns and whatnot, enjoy it. She was telling me that being in the program was helpful to her because when she was thinking about using during the weekend, she would be thinking about coming in on Monday and wanting to be clean so that she could get picks. Even this morning, in a group I did this morning at the hospital, uh, one of the patients said, I really love coming here. This is like the first time I ever felt like I belonged somewhere. One of my patients also said that it's so nice to be acknowledged for doing something positive when they're so um, used to being acknowledged for always doing negative behaviors. People in the trainings that I've um, conducted are really excited about it and at some point um, will share their story with somebody else or share their ideas with somebody else or go back to their clinic and consider using motivational incentives even on their own way even if it's just reminding themselves that they have to tell a client that they did a good job for showing up to group or did a good job for finishing their GED program or great job for you that you, you know, have been three months absent. I mentioned the voucher incentive program, which is a perfectly viable way to do it. Simply reward points to patients each time that they uh, perform their target behavior and then those points can be worth money and they can accumulate in an account and the patients can then choose the kind of rewards that they want. So thinking about a program or a program director who's thinking maybe I should maybe I want to try this contingency management or try this motivational incentives, there are seven principles um, which are basically the core principles of behavior modification um, that actually will be addressed um, as one develops these programs. But I think if people can consciously and purposely address them and look at them and maybe block them out in some ways they develop their programs. I think this will make for much more effective programs. And typically when things go wrong in a behavior modification setting, it's because one of, the, one of these principles has in some ways not been followed or it's been violated or it's been poorly uh, administered in some way. So the seven principles are one, we need to figure out what is the target behavior that we're interested in, in changing. Two, what's the target population, what's the group or subgroup 
that we're interested in focusing our attention on. Three, what is the type of reinforcement? What are we actually going to give people? What is the magnitude of the reinforcer? How much reinforcement are we going to give? What is the frequency of the reinforcement? How often are we going to give a reinforcement or an incentive? And the timing of the incentive. One of the core aspects of contingency management and motivational incentives is that the reinforcer needs to follow the exhibiting of the behavior as immediately as possible. And that the greater the delay between the person's showing a behavior, or demonstrating behavior, and they're receiving a reinforcer, the less powerful that reinforcer is going to be. And then lastly, the duration of the incentive, or the incentive program. How long is it going to go on for? Clinicians were, were smiling and thanking us for this and saying that they didn't believe it was going to work, but you know, here it is, it's working. And they like it. They like being thanked for helping them, the patients, achieve goals. There are benefits for everybody in this. It's not only, it's certainly the patients who are then not fighting with the counselors, but it's the counselors also not fighting with the patients. And the whole environment, the whole ambience of the clinic has essentially changed in the last uh, five years. We hear things from our staff like, I can't wait to come to work in the morning. I think contingency management is really the most powerful psychosocial intervention for addiction addictions that there is. I wasn't a big fan. I thought that people should go to treatment because they wanted to be well. But now, working there, I see contingency management do have a major impact on their change in behavior and attitudes towards treatment. What they need is hope and faith, and this is an intervention that offers clients hope and faith, so we really believe that this is the way to go. It's, I don't know, I can't, that's a loss for words. It's, all of a sudden, I've had a couple of lousy days, today is beautiful. You know, and it kind of shows me that it does work. It has built a structure, an inner structure, that uh, I don't believe was there before. This program has done a lot for me, you know. And they give, they lift my self-esteem up, you know. Um, made me feel self-worth something, you know. Want to do something with my life. And I feel good. I feel real good. Why shouldn't we reward our clients for clean urines, for showing up for treatment? You know, they've been so beaten down and they finally crawl in our doors. And how nice is it that we can say to them, you know what, you did good, you stayed clean pick a reward for doing that. So I think it's a great opportunity to show our clients that they're worth something because if it doesn't start with us, where will it start? If you would like to learn more about celebrating success for recovery and retention, contact your regional addiction technology transfer center. And thank you for your interest in helping us all improve the field of addiction treatment.